it's really good to be here. Um, I was spent uh, a bit of time yesterday with the Demin crowd, and uh, that helped to sort of uh, culture me. And, uh, and as I as I get used uh, more and more to being Anderson, I'm at Anderson. I'm liking it more and more. And my wife on the bay back row will keep me in order. You need to relax a bit because when she's here, she's looking after the time, uh, the volume, the length, the boredom. And she has a way of just uh, communicating. So on behalf of the audience, she's always a great asset, I tell you. Um, I just have one thing. You should never be defensive when you speak. Never. Uh, but it turns out that actually in terms of the, um, the PowerPoints, um, the last conference I led uh, on, on a different issue, uh, a pastor came up to me afterwards and uh, said to me, I was, you, know, you never know what's going to happen, he said, your PowerPoints were pathetic. Now, there's, you know, when somebody really lets you know, you're, you're kind of grateful for the feedback. But he said, I'm colorblind. I couldn't make head or tail of any of them. So if they're problems, it's not really my strength. Uh, they are really intended to give, as we go along, sort of staging posts, some of the quotations which I think are worth looking at are there and bits and pieces. But they're to help me so that we keep the flow going and I make the most of of my time and don't get too sidetracked, which can very easily happen. Uh, an English preacher, uh, Ron Boyd Macmillan, uh, has written a book uh, which is called Explosive Preaching. It's a doddery uh, preacher in Cassock with an equally doddery congregation. Um, and you'll see on the pulpit ledge a stick of dynamite. And uh, Boyd Macmillan's thesis is that in preaching there are four key elements. There's a dynamite, which is the word of God. Uh, the word for power, Greek word, of course, is dunamis, and there's a lot of that in scripture. Uh, you need scripture. The fuse is the preacher, and uh, you don't get far without the preacher, said Martin Luther. Preaching cannot occur without the mouth of a living witness to the truth, the preacher. Third, the spark, the Holy Spirit, without whom nothing happens. And fourth, and obviously you're thinking what would be the fourth thing, perhaps you're thinking, uh, what would be the fourth thing, something to do with the hearers? Well, for him, the word is placement, because he wants to emphasize that when you have this uh, dynamite explosive, and you need to make sure it, it's placed properly, otherwise it just harmlessly explodes somewhere off center. Now, he apologizes for the over-militaristic over uh, language of this, but he says, I believe that preaching should make a difference and uh, I want to use this language to talk about its impact. But the reality is, of course, for many people, this is rather amusing. Uh, preaching, uh, dangerous, harmful. It's much more likely to see the preacher handling uh, Play-Doh than TNT. Um, when we think of preaching, a danger doesn't always come rapidly to mind. Indeed, uh, um, Boyd McMillan himself says that having talked to literally hundreds of listeners, he said, I've come to this wearying conclusion, scratch a typical listener to sermons today and it's not blessing you find underneath, it's boredom. And in a recent um, a very interesting book by Laurie Carroll, Preaching That Matters, which is an assessment of, of preaching in North America especially, she says that she's interviewed so many hundreds of pastors and over 30,000 listeners are involved in this series, but she kept finding there are preachers who were somewhat disappointed in the act of preaching, and it didn't seem to do very much. She quotes one of them, uh, who says about uh, his reactions to it, when I first received my call to ministry and began to study the great preachers, I envisaged changing the world through my preaching. Now that goal seems naive, an unattainable ideal. When I think about the aspirations I had when I was new to ministry, I almost feel embarrassed. Me, a world-changing preacher, yeah, right. Sometimes the preachers, those of us who've done a lot of it, it, it can seem like an endless round. Uh, John Daly defines preaching uh, as a hybrid of a beauty contest, a piano recital, and a competitive sporting event. Much more kindly, Mark Laverton regards preaching with worship as something that uh, 
he's more positive about it. As he puts it, uh, it offers the baked potatoes of love, the melting butter of grace with just enough bacon and chives of outreach to ease the conscience. But Davis, not likely. Really, not likely. Now I'm going to argue in these three lectures that the preaching act demands of the preacher an extraordinary commitment to and submission to the explosive power of the gospel that transforms. Uh, and that, that to think of preaching as a teaching exercise or a devotional sharing or much worse, a skimming through some scripture truth and making it as entertaining as possible. But to be involved in this is fake preaching. And when you set the bar low, of course, to talk of danger is absurd. But to raise it, which is what I'm seeking to do, um, introduces all sorts of, of extra demands. Now, this lecture owes much to my reading of Mark Lapperton's book. Maybe some of you have read it, The Dangerous Act of Worship. Have any of you been able to read that book? In the book, he makes several issues which I think are, are, are really relevant uh, to our um, subject. Um, the, uh, the way he talks about it is that worship turns out to be the dangerous act of waking up to God and to the purpose of God in the world and then living lives that actually show it. It's dangerous because it means encounter. And encounter means something will happen as an experience which are fearful, overwhelmed, convicted, transported, sometimes euphoric the response to the disruptive creator. Whirlwinds of God's unmatched power and authority, says he quotes Anne Dillard, who said that worship, uh, preparing worship, is like making up a batch of TNT, giving glory to God the Father, the Son, the Spirit, but involve, uh, involving encounter and enactment of God's love and justice and, and mercy and kindness in the world. But what uh, Laberton does is to talk about the false dangers which we want to protect ourselves against. Uh, and the false dangers in, in preaching uh, as uh, with worship are often to do with the, the issues of making sure that uh, the microphone's not open to too many people. Uh, we don't want an open microphone where anybody can speak. We're horrified at the thought of healing services no way would we ever allow that to happen. We're terrified we might not be relevant, meet the congregation's expectations. Uh, we're petrified of losing popularity and the congregation dissolving. And we're nervous about the rhythm of things not being familiar and disturbing people. And so we do our best because those things, and they're always true of any public speaking, we do our best in order to try and make sure that those dangers are avoided. But for God, these aren't the dangers. The, these aren't the real dangers at all. Uh, these factors, in fact, are about protecting ourselves from the one thing that actually renders preaching harmless. Because these things are, and enable us and, and charge us in the one direction of taking control. We want to take control, cut down the risks, no open microphones, of course, uh, keep it under safe control, keep it predictable, keep the consumers happy, keep the offerings up. By all means, maintain something that means that uh, people are going to stay with you to take control. We take charge. And uh, by taking charge at a stroke, uh, we plunge into safe preaching. Safe preaching. It's only a few times, a few occasions of preaching that we begin to develop coping systems. Uh, we want to know how to make it work as painlessly as possible. And so we develop those and we need some. My uh, father was a pastor and uh, I remember as children, uh, he would sometimes come out of his uh, study door uh, with obvious relief on his face. I've done another sermon, he'd say. And uh, there was a smile on his face, which we were glad to see. And then sometimes he even played cricket with us in the backyard, which is a noble game. Sadly, hasn't taken off as it should do. Uh, I commend cricket to you. 
Um, but I, I mustn't sidetrack. Carol will have something to say to me if I do. But the reality was that this clearly was a big burden. It took some time, and now it was done. And we've got coping systems, and we developed them early on in order to make sure that we time manage in busy lives. We have to time manage the whole task of making sure we get the job done. Uh, but of course, the coping system can easily become a controlling mechanism, which itself can render preaching safe. We have a system, when John Piper writes about professionalism, brothers, we're not professionals. He warns about uh, ministry being a job to do just like any other profession with the same expectations and the same outcomes. Uh, but one of the telltale signs of professionalism is this strong control, this systematizing so that we know what's going on and we are in charge of it. And it's become especially a mark of, of modernity. In his book, which I'm going to refer to uh, later, Ross Hastings, um, he talks about the marks of modernity of the last 200 years, especially of uh, Enlightenment thinking. And he lists the things, he's got 11 of them, and they're things we, we would expect, consumerism, individualism, hedonism, uh, even cynicism. He said these are especially marks of where we've been living through the 19th, 20th century. But then he lists one, it includes one, control. He says control is one of the most significant aspects of all. The uh, human desire and ability to be in total control of the planning and the outcomes. And the dangers for this in church life and preaching life are fairly obvious, aren't they? Van Gelder warns about how much church, church planting has actually been driven by this modern desire to sort of take, take charge and plan it and assume we've got the outcomes right. And uh, Os Guinness, I don't know if you've uh, encountered him much, uh, a most interesting observer of culture. Um, Os Guinness comments about the church has so uh, mimicked uh, uh, the modern world and its control of its ends through rational means that we face situations where more and more of what was formerly left to God is now classified, calculated, and controlled by systematic application of reason and technique. And at the worst, this has caused a kind of uh, cause-effect reductionism. And I've written um, elsewhere um, about the way in which this can paralyse preaching because what happens is a church assumes in its committees and its boards and its structures that they know what leadership is. And they say, we're going to get on with this and we're going to let the preacher do what well, you, you preach, which essentially is devotional truth in a box. It's about God, but the real work occurs somewhere else. Now, this is a great danger, but of course it leaks into the preaching exercise because we also, through our coping systems, have found ourselves sometimes developing a systems which smother spiritual dynamic and avoid risks and, of course, result in the same old, the same old. And so we find ourselves very often caught up in something which has become utterly familiar. And Labberton, speaking about the impact in worship, he says he sees in many of our churches a sleepiness where no worship can lead us to feel faith but not to actually to believe, can lead us to imply we're trusting without ever really taking a risk. It leaves us safe, which can mean we're lost, disengaged, disconnected and disinterested. I believe that we're at a very important time where we face a kind of a decision, a, a crossroads, where we can begin to talk about uh, the control, uh, where uh, we are actually uh, totally, we feel responsible in practice. We would never say that, of course, we still say our prayers. And in practice, we're still essentially in control or more of God in control. Now, this is a very uh, a big deal. And as the 21st century moves on, I believe there's a stark choice between continuing as before with human agency, 
which is essentially saying we, we've got an issue, we've got culture which is demanding, we've got increasing pluralism and materialism and individualism. We must do the very best we can. Or a, a fresh understanding of God and the world and the church and the opportunity to throw ourselves. Oswald Chambers is one of my great sort of spiritual mentors. He talks about throwing ourselves with reckless reliance on God and daring to believe that he is capable of more and opening up our own imagination and creativity by definition beyond where we are at the moment. Now of course this may seem utterly naive and simplistic because we always want God to be in control. I'm speaking to you now and I want the Lord to have helped and the words I'm saying to be something that he will uh, he will uh, endorse uh, and it may even be that and I'm aware of this too but it, it seems simplistic in terms of you know there was that uh, heresy in the second century uh, called Montanism where some people had a they felt a hotline direct to God and through the spirit and they say God's spoken to me I've got it we often suffer from people like that actually we make people suffer ourselves sometimes when we have it right. But underlying this tension is this deep conviction I have that we are facing something where uh, between the contrasts of us taking control and the safe packages, as I put it, of the preaching delivery, I'm especially talking about preaching, it refers to much as the contrast between the safe packages um, and what God's calling us to is for me uh, dramatic stuff. And this is the tension that underlines that uh, may seem, as I say, um, a little too general and but I want to unpack it a little and I want your patience please to follow with me. And at this point um, I'm going to give you an example from my own sermon bag of a sermon that I now regard, I now regard as safe. I did not at the time I preached it and it's not a bad sermon because I, I wouldn't give you an example I'm, I'm not so humble I give you a really bad I could but I'm not going to uh, and I'm going to turn to a passage which none of you will have ever read before uh, it's uh, certainly not a favorite um, um, evangelical passage uh, it's um, something which uh, we struggle getting into the great Commission. Now, uh, as I go on talking about uh, preaching, of course, many of us will have our favourites and we will need, especially with our traditions. So here we have, and uh, we know the word so well, now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And remember I'm with you always to the end of the age. I wonder how many times that's been preached by us in this place. You talk about tens of times, I'm sure. I have a system where when I preach, I have two exercise books and I've got every chapter of the Bible. I made them myself as exercise books, but every time I preach in a chapter, I choose the verses and I highlight what the, the, the title was and then where I preached it, uh, the date. Uh, and so I just look this up and, um, and I found myself uh, with a whole range uh, with uh, titles which give a great deal away because you know a kind of thing which is going to happen. Uh, come go fight. David Livingston, it was David Livingston's great text. It's quite something that motivated him as a missionary pioneer. Um, great adventure to boldly go, Star Trek. Maximum God, Maximum Disciples, a bit of alliteration there. Uh, Supreme Lord, another bit of alliteration. Spontaneous people going places. I mean, th th this I preach, and each one of those, of course, will have uh, different emphases. They're fresh and they're new. Um, hopefully, I mean, that's, that's meant to be part of what happens, isn't it? And then I've got this one, 
uh, which is what I want to focus on. Because uh, what happened with this one, it was called Can I Avoid Him? Uh, I was preaching in Cambridge and it was a believer's baptismal service. I belonged to a Baptist community. And there were five undergraduates who come to faith, uh, two or three of them from very, very hostile uh, backgrounds. Uh, one of them had a strong atheist her parents had not been to church, most of them, before they came to Cambridge. And they'd met Jesus, and they were being baptised. And so the deal was that uh, as I was preaching, we were anticipating their baptism, but they had spoken already, because that was part of it as well. But you would give, um, you, you'd speak about your own journey with the Lord. Uh, and so it was a demanding time when you were going to have a witness to uh, the making of disciples in our midst, and a call upon them, and because it was a very, it was a, in the city centre and there were always lots of non-Christians and they'd all invited their friends and there was a big gallery around a church that held a thousand people. There, there was a possibility of a lot of people just on the search. So, can I avoid him? So you can imagine, this is just the bare bones of what happened as I preached. I, I, I just, um, I said, you know, glad to see you. There are six sermons today. Uh, well five people are going to be baptised and that's just about as big a sermon as you can give. And I'm going to say my bit. It's not going to be that long. Everybody relaxes, you know. You relax, you know. And, and I want to say this, that um, there are going to be some people here, especially those for whom this is a very uncomfortable moment, who are going to say, I've just got to sit still and this is all going to cope by. It's another, you know, religious thing. It's going to be challenging, honestly. It's, but I, I've just, and really, if I'm just, just put it out of my mind, I'm going to get through it. And, uh, and I just want to say to you, if you're just saying, can I avoid him? Can I avoid him? You can't. Uh, and the reasons for that, well, there's several of them, but I just want to give you a couple. The first reason why you can't avoid him is because he is a Lord um, of authority. And uh, when you look at the scripture passage, you need to understand that uh, authority, which is absolutely vital for all of us, and we, you know, we've got authorities in our lives from the moment we're born. We've got our parents' authority and other people, and we've got the school, and we've got uh, college, and we've got professors, and we've got police, and we've got uh, the government with the laws that are being passed of the land. We've got all these authorities. We've got experts in the area we're interested in. Authority upon authority, and of course, we, we, we live with authority, and, and authority is part of our lives. And I happened to, at this point, living in Cambridge, uh, we were on a, the long road, it was the Roman road, which went all the way from the south of Cambridge right through, dead straight, which Roman roads are. I mean, not that Romans use it now, you understand, but didn't it? So the, the historical past had it as a Roman road, and, um, and I cycled on it. And as I left the house, just the week before, uh, the, the traffic was absolutely stationary in front, uh, nothing moving. And I thought, this is odd, because it's half a mile off the uh, traffic lights, but it's, it, <coughs> stuff's always moving, it's busy. But, and, uh, just, and then occasionally there's a slight shuffle. So I cycled up, and there was a cycle lane, and I really made good progress. I was up the traffic lights, just in a, in a, in a minute or two, and there were a couple of, of police cadets in fluorescent vests, which were very big for them. They looked about 12 years old. They were probably um, a little older than that, but they looked very young. And I got to the traffic lights, and there they were, just where I was. And one said to the other, what do we do now? And this was a moment when I realised that, you know, leadership should have authority. Everybody was stationary. Five streams of traffic. It was a bit complicated, because you cycle lanes through but it was completely stuck. What do we do now? We need authorities that know. And the reality of the Christian story is that at this point in Matthew 28, we have the one person who claims all authority has been given to me. Because that really is true. There is nothing now as is risen from the dead that Jesus Christ is not sovereign Lord of. And when he speaks about all authority, the word is the same as we use for parents and judges, and it's social and legal, and it, it covers the whole range. 
So let's understand that this Lord is the, the pivotal figure when it comes to authority. And I can't say to him, oh, that part of my life doesn't concern you, because every part of my life concerns him. Actually, it's much more than that, isn't it? Because it's not just the bits of life we see, it's the life we don't see. It's all authority in heaven and on earth. It's what we don't see and what we don't perceive. And we suddenly realize that something here is almost, it's cosmic in terms of what this Lord has done because he's risen from the dead nobody else has ever done that so this is different and so this is the authority in a world where there's much to confuse and much to disagree with this all authority he says all authority and because of that we need to recognise the significance of his commands and when he speaks to us uh, uh, about what it means at this moment to disciples, to go and make more disciples. We find ourselves challenged that the go and make disciples, which in this service, of course, we're actually seeing again. This is about the making of disciples. Don't forget that key. And disciples are people who accept his authority. And that means that uh, people want to learn. They want to stay close. Jesus doesn't want admirers. He wants to he wants followers, he doesn't want discussion, he wants action. And under his authority, we are to make more disciples under his authority. Let no one doubt that the Great Commission is given by the highest authority in the land, in the universe. It's binding on all disciples for all time. Can you and I avoid him? Can you avoid him? I don't know how long that took. I mean, now I'm not quite sure how long it took, but uh, as I preached that sermon, uh, we prepared for baptism. And the reason why I would rate that sermon at the time as fairly effective was that there was a stillness that comes, you know, because they were going to see, for many people, the first time ever, believers' baptism, it's rare, in Britain, in the secular, certainly the city of Cambridge. And... Um, at the end when I made an appeal for new disciples to come commit themselves to Jesus, five people came forward. So you'd say, I'd say that, that wasn't a bad sermon. But it was safe. I want you just to reflect for a moment. He says it's safe. What does he mean? I'll just give you a moment. And if you're close enough to somebody else, you might turn to them and say, yeah, I can see what he means. Or you can say, I, I don't, what's he all about? Have I missed something? Because this for me is safe. And I'm going to give you, in a moment, a couple of areas where I now see it. I didn't see it at the time. I wouldn't have seen it until about two, three years ago when I was freshly engaged in some new work. I now say it was safe. So just a moment's pause, reflection. Safe sermon, how, why? And uh, if you've got a neighbour close, some of us haven't, we're strategically placed miles from anybody else. Uh, just, just, just gossip for a minute. Why was it safe? I'm not going to ask because we're too big. It's if it was a seminar, we'd have a break and get this involved. But unless somebody can really say, I know, and they're bursting with prophetic zeal. As the whispering takes place, um, we have a moment. Is there some uh, 
somebody who says, I, I think I know uh, what you're on about, safe, and I'd, I'd stick my hand up and say, I think I know. Um, well, let, let me just move on, because uh, uh, I'd like to tell you. No. Um, actually, I don't want to tell you particularly, because uh, it, it reveals uh, sort of areas of, of weakness. Um, because what happened was, the first thing that I believe uh, reveals uh, was that I, I preached a one-dimensional past tense God. Um, Carol and I uh, recently, uh, we wanted a floor lamp for our home and we went to a store and there was this floor lamp that was magnificent, it was an uplighter and then it had a branch for reading which uh, and, and switches and, and we lifted it, it was really very attractive. And so we looked at them and we said let's go for it and we were really bold, it was on sale, that helped us and so we went for this and we ordered it and then they produced a ridiculously small box. This thing was uh, seven feet high but this box was this size and when we opened it, it was full of bits uh, with flex running through it and an Allen screwdriver and uh, um, instructions which were kind of photocopied um, uh, drawn by a child uh, <laughs> and, um, and I'm not particularly practical anyway but this I was so disappointed when I saw the box even more disappointed and just the week before we flew out uh, back to Chicago um, having constructed this thing which wobbles and the shade doesn't, I have to adjust it every time I go past it, uh, the bottom lampshade just fell off. Uh, and uh, this is a disaster with a kind of do-it-yourself uh, flat packing for some of us. Some of us it works. But when it comes to preaching sermons, I have to say it's disastrous. Uh, because what happens is I preach to one-dimensional past tense God. Now, I didn't mean to. Uh, and you could, if you listen to it, hear other things, but looking back on it, I recognise that I gave the impression that Jesus, the all-powerful Lord, was a standalone Lord on a mountain 2,000 years ago, who was given a challenge that means we now have to respond as best we can. And I completely omit it, even though I knew it and had been taught about it. I completely omitted uh, spectacularly to express the who and why about our sending God to give it its label, I completely omitted the glorious doctrine of Missio Dei, the sending God. On the surface, this sermon seemed to emphasize just this point, that we have Jesus who sends us to go. I mean, on the surface, it looks as though it's exactly that. But one of the great rediscoveries of the last few years is the uh, Missio Dei, as we marvel that God, when he so loved the world, sent his son, taking the initiative with the whole world as ascending God in three persons. A God in triune community of love and power, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, belonging together in divine mission, actively sending and loving and empowering so that the world might be brought back into belonging in his kingdom. And they still are Father, Son and Holy Spirit. God's being, his agency, should empower our being and our working for him. And mission, God's mission from beginning to end, means this shouldn't be the Great Commission, this is the Great Co-Commission. This is something that the Lord is doing with us. And when Irenaeus had the famous picture of God the Father, oversimplifying of course, but God the Father with the two hands of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and how they work together. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's over simple, we realise, but it, it challenges dramatically this sense in which so often we've been one-handed uh, and many, many times we've emphasised Jesus uh, to the exclusion of the Father and, tragically, to the Holy Spirit, the mover right now with us, with the Lord. Now, this... Uh, sense of believing in the Father and the Spirit. Of course I believe, I'm a Trinitarian, but I preached 
and fail to highlight the transforming difference they make in community with Jesus. And I can't, as I think back, I can't imagine why I was so Christocentric that I gave no hint of Jesus being a vital relationship with his father so that he was fulfilling a mission for the father whose love holds the world. And amazingly, in this particular sermon, I made no mention of baptism being in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I have actually heard, I've heard baptism was in the name of Jesus. Does it matter? It's only ever, it could be done in the name of Jesus only. Too right it matters. For the triune God really is a whole business of, as we commit, especially in baptism, Jesus is bringing glory to the Father in the witness of baptism. He's promised the sending of the Holy Spirit and to omit a mention of the Holy Spirit has, uh, it flat packs God. It just reduces the wonder and the mystery and the dynamics, it flat packs them. And while talking about Jesus having authority, there's a danger of giving the impression that uh, making disciples is a response that now largely falls on our shoulders. Uh, Jesus truly gave us that response and he's got the authority to do it. And up until this point in the Gospels, uh, he was there. But now we've reached Matthew 28, 16 and 20. He's saying, you go, do it. And the agency seems to be switching much more to us, giving us control to make it as work as well as we can and to make mission part of our church so that from now on as they joined my church which was called St Andrew Street Baptist Church we had our own system we put every baptismal candidate in a mentoring relationship with an older disciple and we followed them through everyone had to belong to a small group where they were nurtured <coughs> the whole task of sending missionaries as a church all of this was vital it can all be done of course without mentioning the Father and the Spirit. And we better understand, I better understand, that it matters that we have a three dimensional present tense Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I mentioned uh, two major defects. Uh, the second was uh, a one dimensional treatment of Scripture. It's uh, very easy with a famous passage especially to lift it out and identify two points, three points, whatever. Uh, and as we do that, to make it a kind of standalone event and to miss the fact that scripture is God's ongoing missionary story. And those of us who've read anything recently about the need for a missionary hermeneutic of scripture as God's mission book, will realize how safe, safe, my sermon was. Uh, I, I seem to have forgotten that uh, God's mission actually begins right the way through. It's seen in the Old Testament, of course, in the incarnation uh, of, of our Lord and the resurrection. It moves on through. The cross and the resurrection, they were in my sermon a little, but very little hint that when the creation went bad in the fall, uh, God's rescue act involved his son that something profound would be happening so but when he came and said in his first words mark 1 14 uh, repent and believe the kingdom of god is at hand he was talking about something very significant and uh, what happens on the mountain after resurrection is still to do with that very significant thing and isaiah 61 in luke 4 and all the other things there they're coming together. You don't just, you just look at Jesus now and you have to tell something more, reveal something more of an unimaginable story. None of which is predictable. It doesn't begin predictably in Genesis. That God should create ex nihilo and should do it out of love. Uh, incarnation is the most extraordinary thing. Uh, at every step of the way, it's extraordinary. And now Jesus is calling us that we might belong within this story, which is, by the way, going on. Because the glorious crowning is the consummation when every knee will bow. Don't understand how that could happen, how could it possibly help? 
There's lots of evidence around that doesn't seem to suggest it will happen. Scripture says that's where it's going. So tell us. That's it. Now you say, you know, it's just a sermon. You can't say all that. No, but I gave no hint of it. I, I gave no mention that when you actually follow Jesus and you become a disciple, you're part of a very big story. And you can't imagine by the way, you cannot imagine what that will mean for you in community. And so we find ourselves caught up uh, and uh, all the way through, though God used my sermon in his grace, and he did, and, and he does use us, because we're always learning, we're always things. Though he used that, uh, it seems to me now as I reflect that the preaching was uh, Christocentric in the in, in, in negative sense. It failed to do justice to the Father, Jesus with the Father and the Spirit. It was church-centric. It assumed we now have a task to make disciples by whatever means we can. It was pragmatic. It's something that we church do and we've got our own programs to keep our disciples and to keep them making more disciples. And it was flat theologically. There was, there was no sense that the resurrected Jesus now invites me into a very different sort of community. Now why in the last two or three years have I started to talk about and look back at my sermons and say that was too safe? It's because, and some of you, no surprise, especially demon students here who've been reading, it's because I've been aware that if you wanted one word to, to sum up uh, God is in control. You have to use this. I mean, it's such an irritating word for some people because it's so overused and so under misunderstood. Missional. It really is true that missional theology. I'm talking about theology because that's where the missional heart is. Missional theology uh, contrasts the issue of control, where the control is, like nothing else. Uh, it contrasts the control. Now, missional has become, as I say, uh, so confusing and jargony. It's plastered on the outside of almost anything practical for Jesus. Uh, you know, ask somebody if they're missional, and of course they are. And it's the cruel word. I'm missional, my church is missional. Um, but the question is, what, what do we mean by that? And what do we understand theologically? One theologian says the crunch really comes between seeing missions plural as evangelistic mission, mission efforts of churches, essentially ecclesiastical, and mission singular, which is God's mission project. Speaking of God and his agency for the world. And uh, the issue of missional theology sees the essence of the church uh, as a community participating in the mission of God, Father, Son and Spirit, the church gathered in the life of Christ, scattered by the Holy Spirit, but as part of his kingdom. For the kingdom's the true embodiment of God's action through history until its consummation. And so when you begin to think this way, you realise how <clears throat> missional preaching will open up to our triune God at work today, not by labels, but by an experiential expectation. And uh, there will be this opening up to, to the mission story in scripture. And the more I have looked at the literature, the more excited I have become at the ways in which the Lord is empowering me in ways that well, not only, of course, are they his leading, but they're his gifting, they're his creativity. Um, you won't be able to see this very clearly, I, I'm afraid. It's from a, a mapping book by a couple, Van Gelder, and somebody whose name I can't pronounce. Um, but the, they have a range, and they, they have ranged over hundreds of books and authorities where, who use the name missional. And, and it's a tree fed by things that you won't be able to see. Because at the bottom here, it's got to Missio Dei. Somebody's mentioned that recently. Uh, Trinitarian Missiology. Um, missional Hermeneutic. These are the roots, but on the left-hand side, you have Discovering. 
which is where my Matthew 28 sermon was. Um, kind of beginning to understand, but high human agency. And, uh, and as you move through discovering, utilizing, engaging, extending, so you find yourselves moving more and more towards the divine agency. And for the authors, for them, it means preaching which encourages, they use the expression, theologically informed social imagination. It's a mouthful, but it speaks of the reality of people perceiving who they are in God's kingdom. A theologically informed social imagination. They're doing it together. And they suddenly realise that they owe everything that they are together to a Lord who's called them to be. And he actually, and you have to discern it, he's calling you to live it out. One of the passages in the book which seems to me to sum up some of the, the crucial uh, thinking here um, is, is this one. Uh, the perspective of mission theology is that the outcomes are not predetermined. Wow. How are preaching a baptismal service? Don't you want people to respond as, as believers, commit their lives to the Lord? Of course you do. But that's only the starting point. It, it, what, can, can we help people to see beyond that starting point? Because that's the critical issue. When you say yes to the Lord, and you open up to the spirit and you belong in God's kingdom, you cannot tell what will happen. I certainly can't as the preacher and I have to open up that vista. The ordinary members of a congregation are invited to discern and live into a missional future under the leadership of the spirit. Now they don't talk about preaching as such but I, I want to tease out in the next uh, two lectures what what does this mean for preaching? It looks as though preaching might be doing something slightly different. And then it finishes off. The key is for ordinary church members to develop their capacity to listen to God's word in community, to listen to the spirit, and to listen to their neighbors in love, to experience themselves as participants in God's greater movement in the world. Now you could spend an entire lecture just unpacking the threefold uh, dynamic embedded in that. That we're caught up uh, as we listen to God's world, word in community. We're listening to the Spirit. And we're listening to our neighbours in love. And so, preachers, for the last uh, moment or two, I want to talk about preachers. Not many preachers are talking about this yet. Um, and I think the theology, which actually is really demanding, is one that some of us haven't come to terms with yet. I, I know I haven't. Uh, but what really is important to recognize that there are now some people the only preaching book mentioned in this survey was a book by John Daly, written in 2011. Not where I am uh, theologically, but nonetheless, interesting book called Missional Preaching. Uh, John Daly, talking about uh, the uh, impact he believes, he says, for many, the notion of becoming missional has completely transformed their sense of the church. No longer an optional activity of a church, a sense of the church is written. It should be mission. No longer an optional activity of a church, but about participation in God's redeeming activity in a world bent on self-destruction. And for him, uh, this uh, has meant, and he puts it like this, I didn't need to become a better preacher. I needed to have a different image for what I was doing. I needed to become a missional preacher reading the Bible as a missional document. Uh, the word that he picks up, uh, interesting, would be, uh, can be, uh, superficial. One thinks of the makeovers of Madonna, etc. And I realise too much is made sometimes of image, but he asks us to, just to, to confront 
what is the truth about the image we have. In fact, for his doctor of ministry class, he asked them to reflect, and they're all practitioners, on what word best sums up their ministry. I did this with my doctoral uh, class five weeks ago. And uh, when they were introducing themselves and telling their stories, I mean, I knew them all before, but right, I said, here's a list. It's not complete, but it's a genuine. It's not meant to be uh, amusing. Uh, I mean, it is, but it's, not, it's meant to be a genuine reflection. I said, where do you, where do you fit? And uh, we, we paused and worked carefully. Um, and as you go through it, and this is just a few of them, um, several of them were talking about the way in which they're cheerleaders and motivational speakers sometimes. They really are. And they recognise sometimes knacks. John Daly says informer and persuader are his two. He doesn't include them on the list, but they're his two, informer and persuader. Uh, many people wanted to be shepherd, uh, enabler. I don't know where you are, but the reality is that we are taken to a place where maybe the kind of preaching which we've done in the past uh, could look a little different. Uh, the one he wants to use um, in his book and recommend uh, comes from Luke uh, 9, 1 to 11, uh, where Jesus sends out his disciples. And he says, when you reflect on these verses, and he does a Bible study, one of his chapters, he says, the decision for or against the kingdom is a free one, and out of his hands, out of the hands of, of the preacher. It means that the preaching task ceases to be about finding ways to gain acceptance of a message. Now it becomes a search for the clearest way to make the proclamation and then release it. And so he uses apprentice uh, as his preferred model, not a hard servant model, in which the servants remain perpetually dependent on the orders of the master. Jesus is the only one who actually does the work of the kingdom. And in Luke, he says, we glimpse an apprenticeship model of training, one in which the master and the pupils are engaged in identical work, rather than the hard servant. Uh, Jesus sends us, but he's with us, and our work is in vain, unless we realise that the master is working with us, even though we'll only ever be apprentices. Uh, one further image from the book I mentioned, um, Van Gelder, uh, of the uh, cultivator it talks about sowing and watering but God gives the growth you cannot force people to discern and live into a missional future under the leadership of the spirit yet you can invite them with passion and God given biblical imagination seeking to create the conditions under which they can come together in shared life to discover their participation in God's mission our preaching has to help people develop capacity to respond together to God's word. Apprentice, uh, cultivator. The ways in which um, I'm going to move on the next two uh, sessions is going to, if you like, open up some windows on how, um, I won't do it again, preach Matthew 28, more missionally, but I shall give some of, the, some of the clues, and I'm going to call it six and a third commandments for unsafe preaching. It's a third because it's a sort of make way, and I'm just going to mention it, and six because it's nowhere near complete. It's nowhere near ten. And it's in flux and it can grow. But tonight I want to take three, the first three commandments for unsafe preaching. And to unpack some of the things that I've said here in a more systematic way, um, perhaps more sort of systematic, I mustn't make too many promises. Um, and then tomorrow I just want to take another three. But what I'm asking you to do is really dip your toes in the water with me, especially those of you who may be frustrated by all this missional talk. Uh, Scott McKnight is a colleague of mine. A New Testament scholar, his office is next to mine. Scott came in just two weeks ago and said to me, Michael, I'm fed up with missional. Uh, because sometimes you get it up to here. And what I want to do is to say, is the Lord doing something because I believe he is and certainly has been with me?
what might the commandments be for unsafe 